morning to a very cold and damp morning and rainy as you can see everything is wet it rained most of the morning which uh, true was a little bit because we had a, a plan that day to be outside today so we're gonna have to change the plans a little bit and we looked for some indoor activities so we found this place which which is not far from where we were um, slate cavern and we're going to check that out see what it's like as we try to keep a bit dry this time around <laughs> after all the rain that we had yesterday in Fort Marion let's check that out The tunnels and caverns you will see are all man-made over a hundred years ago with only a candle for lighting. The slate in this mine found in the veins between layers of Precambrian rocks is among the oldest in the world and many industrial towns of Britain and Ireland have the original roofs of this mine. The entry to this old and important slate mine is through the main tunnel and as we walked in we were immediately immersed into a bygone way of life as the sound of quarrymen working could be heard not only at the entrance but throughout the caverns. As we continued to walk deep into the mine, we passed under the twin arches of the crypt and entered the lofty cavern number one, also known as the Cathedral Cavern. The large hole to the right is known as the window and is the only source of natural light, although its main function is to provide ventilation into the mine. The long metal rod Rebecca is holding in her hands is known as the jumper tool and it was used by the miners to drill holes in the rock. our way into the cover number two and looking to the left a crane can be seen. This crane is known as the tripod and it was used to lift large blocks of slates out of the mine and into the trucks. The shelves behind the tripod were built by the Minister of Defense during the Second World War and were used to store 2000 tons of TNT as the mine, already closed at that time, had the ideal secure conditions to store explosives. Wow, look at the size of this cavern. Look at that. It's so big. And to think that people used to work here, mining this cavern, to get this late. Look at there. So pretty. Going into cavern number three, perhaps one of the largest we've seen, the second sub-levels is in sight just below us and straight opposite to where we were standing the remains of an old railway track coming from another part of the mine can also be seen. In the olden days of this mine, those tracks would have carried over all the way to where we were as the hole that exists between this level and the one below would have been solid rock at that time. 
opposite us, you can also spot examples of the boxes used to store the slate cavern aged shedder. Looking direct opposite towards the old miner's truck, you will see a tunnel leading to an out of sight cavern, where 20 tons of dragon shedder is matured over a period of 3 months. These boxes hold 20 kilos of dragon shedder, which is made using Welsh milk at the local creamery only 20 miles away. It is then left to mature at the caverns of this lake mine to achieve the real depth of flavor. This is a traditional aging process as the constant temperature and conditions at the mine are perfect for maturing the cheese. And to explode. Yeah, so when they spin it and like dig it, it would work as a drill. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, s you mean that sort of a spear? Yeah, Looks like a spear. spear. Thing. That, that spear that thing that is really heavy. Yeah. Coming out of cavern number three, back into the cathedral, we could hear the sound of music. And as we walked in, we were pleasantly welcomed back by Mare and the beautiful song that she played with her harp. Going down Jacob's Ladder, named after the biblical story of Jacob's Ladder to Heaven, we descended 200 feet below ground to the wonders and more amazing sights of the solid rock granite and connecting tunnels to the various chambers and caverns. At the bottom of the steps and looking up, the remains of another railway track can be seen. These tracks were known as the incline and slates were carried in carts via these tracks, having four men to hold it up, using the winch at the top. To the left of the tracks remains the original steps of Jacob's Ladder. To the right of Jacob's Ladder, we went into the first cavern of sub-level 2. Looking at the high rock face of these caverns, it is easy to forget that men would have been working at these heights with simply a length of chain wrapped around one leg to hold them up, and a candle as lighting. Miners were giving one candle per day, which was far from sufficient. When this candle burnt out, they had to provide their own. These would often have been made from mutton fat and would have been stuck to the rock face with clay, thereby leaving miners with both hands free to work. Going in the opposite direction, I could see a flooded small tunnel to my left. This is an air vent that leads 15 meters further down to the third sub-level of the mine, where there are another four flooded chambers. When the mine was working, the water was pumped out and allowed the miners to continue working at that level. At the top of this cavern, a narrow space can be seen where the miners used to work. From there, a narrow tunnel connects back to cavern number one, or the cathedral. It would take four men to start digging a tunnel, taking three months to reach a cavern size. At times, it was common for miners to discover that the slate underneath was of poor quality and therefore all of their efforts were for nothing.
After hours of exploring the caverns, taking pictures and learning all about the mine, it was time to head outside to check the weather and plan our next stop. As we emerged from the cavern and into the open, we were confronted with the breathtaking view of Cardigan Bay. Look at that view. My goodness, it is so pretty. To our contentment, the weather was starting to give signs of improvement, so we decided that it was time for us to have a taste of the local cuisine and headed to eat at a local pub. When we were done, the weather was much better as the sun was starting to give signs of its appearance. Therefore, we set out on an hour and a half journey, driving further north to our next stop. So after a rainy morning, hiding in the caves and really miserable dump, wet and cold, the weather has completely changed and we arrived at, our, at the second destination of this day. And let me show you, you're not gonna be disappointed. This is gorgeous. Now, look at that. I'm not gonna even try to pronounce the name of this beach. So you'll find that down below <laughs> on the screen. But look at how beautiful this is. This is so beautiful. Comparable to any other European beach I have ever been. Sandwing Beach is a blue flag beach backed by Newboro National Nature Reserve and Forest on the southwestern tip of Bangazi. Landwin is not quite an island as it remains attached to the mainland at all times, except during the highest tides. It provides excellent views of Snowdonia and the Lynn Peninsula and is part of the new borough Mori National Nature Reserve. That is a path that leads through the grassy hills from the beach to the nature reserve on Landwing Island and the surrounding forest has an excellent network of footpaths. Landwing Island is located at the far end of the beach near New Boro Warren. This narrow finger of land is an ideal picnic site during fine weather but also an exhilarating place when the winter winds blow. Its rolling dunes, large rock outcrops and mixture of historic buildings makes it an ideal place for an afternoon of exploration. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we were not able to walk to the island and explore its landscape and remained at the beach part only. However, and if the stunning sights in front of us were anything to go by, exploring the whole stretch of land is highly recommended. Regardless, and perhaps needless to say, this beach can offer so much. The beach itself is stunning, long and beautifully clean, with the trees as a backdrop. Moreover, there's plenty to do here too, going from sunbathing, bathing, windsurfing, kitesurfing, fishing to ancient Celtic Romans even. But as all good things comes to an end, so did our time at this wonderful location. After all, we still had to drive to our next campsite, some 45 minutes away. Unfortunately, as we made our way out of the paid car park, we got stuck on an hour-long queue as there was only one single lane with payment made at the barrier. By the time we arrived at the campsite, it was dark and all we wanted to do was to go to bed as we were all very tired. If you like this video, don't forget to give me the thumbs up, comment, subscribe and to hit that notification bell. And do not miss my next video as we continue our road trip in Wales. I'll see you then!